I just want to begin with everyone taking a moment and imagine that you're a soldier running through the battlefield. You get hit with a bullet in your leg and your femoral artery is severed. That type of bleed is severe and can kill you in three minutes or less. Unfortunately, every single product that you have in your pack takes five minutes or more to stop a bleed like that. There are no materials on the market that can help you. So when I was 17, I sat down and I thought, well, what can we do? Can we make a material that can respond to the body? Because right now we only have things that can treat the symptoms. They can go on to a wound and they can just stop what you see, right? You hold pressure on it and you wait. And hopefully in some time, that bleed will stop. Uh, there has to be a better way. Uh, so when I was 17, again, I sat down and I started thinking. Uh, and in order to figure this out, the answer actually starts with the cell. Uh, so now, what is a cell? Uh, and if you look in any biology textbook, you'll find that a cell is the simplest unit of life. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you right now is that think of a cell as just a balloon, right? It's filled up with liquid and it interchanges things with its surrounding. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it's alive. It's the smallest possible thing that is alive. But also, I'll tell you that it's the most complex thing that we have in our body, right? These cells that you have, every single person in here is made up of one trillion or trillions of cells uh, that are individually alive, but they're acting in unison. Every single cell is on its own means interacting with its environment. Uh, so how is this possible, right? How does each cell that is individually living its own life able to function by the trillions in something that creates you or me? Uh, and the answer is that we actually don't just have something that are cell to cell. Right? We have this magical amount of polymers in our skin, uh, in, in any tissue that we have, called the extracellular matrix. Our cells, and this is a picture of a cell, uh, actually exist in this mesh. And this mesh called the ECM, or the extracellular matrix, is made of sugars and proteins. And the mesh holds the cell in place, but most of all, the cell, being a complex organism, can actually sense exactly what is on, in, around, and on that extracellular matrix. Right? It can tell how thick a chain is, how big one of those cables are, what it's made out of, and how dense the cables are. Uh, so it turns out that this interaction with the extracellular matrix is unique for every single location in your body. Right? So the ECM in my hand is much different than the ECM in my liver or the ECM in my femoral artery, right? So what we want to do is, as we're looking at designing materials, we have to be able to look at how, we, how the cells interact with this extracellular matrix, right? How we can make something that leverages the cell's ability to understand. Because what we've been looking at so far is just, we see a problem and we want to be able to solve it, uh, but we disregard the cells. We disregard the things that are actually making the actions possible. Uh, we look at the bleeding and we say, okay, we want to hold pressure on it, we want to stop this bleed. Uh, but we can't actually think about, well, what are the cells doing? How are the cells going to react to this event? And again, that answer comes down to the ECM. Uh, so now, scientists have known for years uh, that the extracellular matrix is able to manipulate the ways the cells grow. Uh, so I, since a very young age, I was always very interested in tissue engineering. Uh, so tissue engineering, again, is the field of engineering that allows you to manipulate cells, right? You start with a plate of medium, uh, and you try to grow cells in a way that will allow you to have an effect, right? So uh, my very first project that I worked on at Columbia University was actually trying to regrow cells for your cartilage in your knee. Uh, so say if you have a sports accident, you're able to replace the cartilage. Uh, and the experience that I got there made me realize that there are actually two ways of thinking about problems. Uh, so there are scientists that look at the bottom up. And this is your purely academic approach. Uh, so what I mean by bottom up approach to biomaterials is that they look at the cells, they look at the biomaterials, and they say, well, if I want to regrow skin, what I'm going to do is I am going to replicate exactly what the local extracellular matrix is. So I'm going to build this up molecule by molecule, put them together, introduce that into the tissue, and hopefully one day the, uh, the cells will respond to it because it'll say, okay, this is my extracellular matrix that I'm going to grow into this. Uh, and these products are abundant on the market. They're out there. Uh, but the problem is, it comes back to that point that your extracellular matrix in one place is radically different than that in another place. So these products are expensive. They have to be frozen. 
But the problem with them is that if you put them in one place, it's not going to act the same way every time. Your body will know that it's different. So now there's another way, uh, which is kind of the, the easier way of looking at it, the more medical approach, uh, which is the top-down approach. Uh, so what I mean by top-down is that you see a symptom. You say, okay, I have a wound and I need the wound to heal, or I have a bleeding artery and I need that bleeding artery to not be bleeding. Uh, so I'm going to address the situation by looking at how I can stop that, and that's a pathway-based approach, right? I'm going to introduce a chemical, and that chemical will turn the blood into a solid mass and clot it. Or I'm going to introduce something else uh, that allows you to interact at the biochemical level. But the problem is that neither of these approaches actually look at what's going on with the cells. Nothing talks to the cells. So when I was 17, my idea was, well, what if we can make an adaptive response? Uh, so if you look at the talk that we heard this morning from Skylar Tibbetts, uh, what he was talking about was, was 4D printing, was having materials that respond to their natural environment. Uh, so that's what I started with. Uh, so I said, well, why don't we take a plant, and, and this can be any plant, and what we do is we introduce the ability to make polymers that are similar, not exactly like, but similar to the ones that are in our skin. And what we can do is we can break those pieces down into polymers, or into pieces that are just like Lego blocks. So what happens is that we can take these Lego blocks and put it into a biomaterial. Uh, so when we add these Lego blocks into the surrounding tissue, they'll actually recognize the local extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix is unique to that exact wound, which is different than my wound, than your wound, than a wound on my hand or a wound on my liver. And it'll replicate exactly what it's next to. Uh, so what that allows it to do is respond, but also as it responds, the body recognizes that as a healing event. And it allows the body to work towards healing very quickly. Uh, so I'm going to show you a video. Uh, now, this video, when it comes up, uh, this is a simulated bleed, so I apologize if some of you are queasy. Uh, but this is twice as bad as any arterial bleed that you'll find in your body. Now, this would take five minutes or more, like I said, with anything on the market. And in the time that it's taken me to introduce it, it's completely stopped. And now, how does that happen, you may ask? And what happens is, is once those Lego blocks go on, they reassemble into exactly the extracellular matrix is present. And when the body recognizes that, the body will actually start to produce fibrin. Uh, so, and fibrin is the polymer that is needed to clot blood. So I've done some studies where you can take an artery, you can actually cut a hole into the artery, and obviously it'll start bleeding. You add the gel, and the gel stops the bleeding. But a few seconds later, you can peel the gel away, and it'll look as if the hole has completely healed over. And now that's not because they actually have healed over. Uh, that's not because the gel itself has plugged the hole, but it's because the body has responded. The body has seen this healing action, and the body has created a mesh of fibrin in that place. And that mesh of fibrin will stay there. You, you don't need the gel. As soon as the gel goes on, the body starts the healing process. So now these materials are extremely interesting. Uh, so I mean, I, I showed you that it can stop bleeding. But there are many more applications to materials like this. And one of the biggest applications is just personalized medicine, uh, which is really the future of where everything is going. Uh, so what we're looking at is the ability to have a material such that you can deliver drugs faster. You can have a wound that heals very quickly or much quicker than anything else on the market. You can have treatment of burns. Uh, you can have personalized care exactly where you need it. So this is if you have a diabetic ulcer, you can put this on and potentially be able to heal this wound where it would no longer heal. So, and once again, uh, what I want to leave you guys with is imagine that you are again a soldier. You're running through the battlefield. You get hit in the leg with a bullet and your femoral artery is severed. Except this time what you do is you pull something off of your belt, you hold it to the wound and you press a button and instantaneously the bleeding stops and it, you're on your way to heal. And what we want to look at and what I want you guys to remember is that while we have extremely complex problems, sometimes just like a cell, the answer is extremely simple. It's starting with the simplest pieces and allowing them to reassemble themselves. Thank you very much.